Hey everybody, this is Anomini, uh, and this is Dan. And this is Ron. And uh, we, have a, we have a special guest on today, and his name is? Frank, Frank Mosley. Happy <laughs> to be here. <laughs> Hi, Frank. Happy hey. to be here. Happy to meet you. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so Frank, uh, Frank kindly sent us three uh, short films that are part of a uh, thematically interrelated trilogy, if I'm understanding correctly, that uh, you've been working on or possibly you've been working on it for longer, but but at least the, the timeline from the, the copyright thing seems to suggest like since about 2015 you've been working on yeah, it? Yeah, that's about right. That was when Spider Veins started. That was the first in the batch. Okay. Yeah. Oh yeah, we were trying to watch them in order last night. We weren't sure if there was like a set order. So I guess that's my first question. Well, well, I guess first we should say we watched three short films for the uh, for this interview. Uh, the trilogy consists of uh, Spider Veins, Casa de mi Madre (parentheses My Mother's House), mm -hmm. and Parthenon. And uh, that's the order we watch them in. I don't know if that's the canon order. No, I, I think the canon. I think hopefully the idea is you can really watch them in any order and. As long as you can see the links, I think that's that's important. Uh, I would say, just in terms of how I made them, uh, Spider Veins was first, mm -hmm. and then I was plotting uh, Parthenon, shot Parthenon, but hadn't edited the film yet when I went to Cuba to make My Mother's House, which was just an out of the blue extension of the other two that I knew was something that I needed to make. Okay, made that and then came back uh, to the United States and then finished editing Parthenon. And so what, what I guess was your, your process, cause they're, they're, uh, I mean, they're, I don't want to say unusual cause that sounds kind of like you say they, they, they they don't look like many other movies, I guess, is, is the better way of putting it. There's like a, a really, uh, and, and they're not structured like most other movies, which which I'm guessing was, was part of the intent. And I guess what was your, your kind of process of, of coming to it? Did you initially imagine it as a trilogy? No, it was, it was more, I think what it was, was uh, I, I think I started thinking about how we process the things around us and use the act of performance to, um, I just said my connection is timed out. Is that, uh, did you guys lose me? No, I still hear you. Yeah, you're still here. Oh, wait, oh, oh now, now, you're, now you're gone. <laughs> Oops. Uh-oh, do we lose him? Sorry about that guy. I don't know what happened, guys. Oh, it's all good. We we did like uh, we we did like that episode of The Prisoner when Patrick McGowan couldn't show up. We just kind of did a little brain swap with Ron for a couple minutes. <laughs> um, like, man, what a intense dramatic pause, Frank, before we answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> pause, a ten minute pause to ponder. <laughs> yeah, your question was. Uh, was kind of for me like what they really meant right was that what it what you were asking oh uh, well, well i guess how did you how did you end up how, how did it end up becoming a short film trilogy because that seems like a very specific form and and i was kind of curious like how how much of it you kind of knew going in and then how much of it was just sort of the process happening i guess yeah no i i should clarify that because i i think for me it wasn't like a plan uh, trilogy in any way. It was more like I realized I had a trilogy of three films that I made at a certain time in my life. I was like, oh wow, these are all totally similar and like totally linked. And mm. for me, they're all about using performance um, to be really seen. So like using artifice to find a sort of reality, to realize what you're missing in your life or, or the ways that you're not being uh, seen and analyzed by somebody else. I think specifically in the case of, of Spider Veins, it's like this woman who's using the idea of performance of being an actor, this person that she used to be, she taps back into that as kind of an escape and to kind of see her as alternate person that she could be again if she wanted to. In the case of Casa, it's somebody who's using performance for grief uh, and in the case of Parthenon, I think it's it's somebody who's right in right in the middle. I think Spider Veins is, is a character who is who is uh, acquiesced to normal quote unquote life and just been like, you know what, like now I'm a housewife and I have three kids. That's no longer me. So it's more looking back. Mm. And I think Casa de Mi Madre is a film about a character who's in the thick of it all, who's in the mire, and she's using performance 
for catharsis for grief and then a uh, parthenon would be the one that is looking forward so like sees it like in order to use performance she's able to actually tap into being looked at the way she wants to be looked at for somebody to see her the way she wants to be seen yeah. that's kind of interesting the one that references the antiquity is the the forward yeah the way forward right right at least for me and i mean there's you know other you know, themes in there. I mean, overall, I guess it's about identity, you know, and like how we perceive ourselves versus how other people perceive us. I think that was important for me. When I made Spider Bates specifically, I was at that time, I was about to turn, turn 30. And so I was noticing a lot of friends in my life who were um, changing and getting out of acting or realizing they weren't going to pursue it professionally. So mm -hmm. Our conversations would be a little loaded sometimes when we'd catch up and they'd be talking about a world that was very different than the one we used to share. And then I'd feel guilty because I didn't want to talk about it too much to make them miss it but then also I didn't want them to think that I wasn't still creating and still doing the things that we had always talked about doing so spider veins kind of came at that crucial point um and for any listeners who don't know uh, Frank doesn't just uh, direct movies he's also acted in yeah. a lot of movies I, yeah I love I love acting I love acting as much as directing <laughs> to me there I can't have one without the other. Usually when I'm directing, I feel like acting and vice versa, you know. Peanut butter and jelly kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. How are you able to con to contain yourself or restrain yourself from not putting yourself in these movies? You know, it's a really good question. Uh, I, I will say part of it's that I'm never a, a, a monitor director. Like, I'm never one to stand back. Mm. And for me, I, I want the the actors to feel like I'm I'm the camera right next to it or that I'm always right there with them so that I'm also a participant right there with them in the space. I'm never like this omniscient voice. You know, you hear these stories about old Hollywood and these directors from their trailer, like, a, you know, some kind of mic that taps into like yards of cable <laughs> in the studio and like the voice comes down, it's like, take the shot again, like take it back to work, like this big, so I want to be very, I want there to be a sense of immediacy. Oh yeah, they, they always got that like rolled up thing that they're talking at, like some kind of dollar store right. voice of God. Right, and I, that's, that's not what I want. You know, I want them to think of me as like a silent player within the scene with them who um, is there to collaborate and to take care of them so that they can explore and find the things they need to find, you know? So I just like to be right there with them as much as, as, as close as I can be without being in the shot. And so when you, you were making the films, how much of it was scripted and, and how much kind of arose out of this um, kind of in the moment interaction and, and kind of uh, connection with the actors and performers? Well, so I'll say that um, generally speaking, uh, I'm a big believer in rehearsal, um, generally. And, you know, I, I have some theater background, but I wouldn't say that I'm like, I do a lot of theater. I, I did theater in high school. I've done only one or two plays as an adult, um, but I've always been fascinated by theater. I like going to theater, seeing plays. Um, but for me, rehearsal can be so key, especially if you have a limited budget, you're making an indie, and you only have enough film you only have enough money to pay the dp this one day you can't explore and take time over a week unless you're you're on the same unless you're shooting for no money on a dv camera right exactly and you and you, your like, car. we all are doing this together in a space <laughs> with a green screen and we're just gonna like play you know and there's nothing wrong with that either but I, but i think for me um everything with these three films were heavily scripted and that is not only on a dialogue level but also with a physicality level like in the case of parthenon you know there's really hardly any dialogue so the mm -hmm. entire script i had written almost like a beckett play to where it's like every every beat every action was a counteract dance and i'd specifically written that film to be performed by lily baldwin who one of my best friends is a, a colorist and he had Back in the, I think it was like 2007, 2008, he had moved to New York and he'd started coloring all these like amazing dance pieces. They were like these experimental dance narratives directed, written by and starring Lily Baldwin. And I was like, who is that? Like, she's incredible presence. Like, like this is really fascinating. And at that time, I was getting back into my love of theater, back into watching all sorts of performance art, thinking about Maya Darren a little bit. And I was like, this would be, this would be great to see if she'd want to collaborate on something. So I pitched an idea of collaborating with Lily Baldwin in, in man, 2008, uh, maybe 2009. But we didn't end up actually doing anything, as you know, to like, you know, 2015 or 14, yeah. I started writing the script. And I said, hey, I think I finally got something. And I think for her, rightfully so, it was a matter of trust, not only because the material was 
was had nudity and, and dealt with sexuality and vulnerability in spades but um she also wasn't at the helm like it wasn't her own film and so i think she was like this is my first time just to be in a film that's not really a dance film you can incorporate some of her talent with that but having this guy direct you know who she's still i mean the first half of it does feel kind of like may maybe not like a like a like a tradition I, I don't know if there is such a thing as a, I guess a traditional dance movie would be like a Fred Astaire movie or something, but like, yeah. like, uh, like those Shirley Clark movies where she's just yeah. following around the ballerina or something, uh, uh, not bridges go around. What's the, what's the one where it's just literally the woman dancing for like, it'll come to me. No, I know what you mean though. And I, I think what I was hoping was to, one, she just had this incredible presence. I was like, would be great for this idea. And originally those two scenes in Parthenon were two separate short film ideas that once I decided the link was the same protagonist in both to show this kind of diptych. Then I was like, okay, click, I can pitch this to Lily. Thankfully, she, she got all the things that I was into. She was into making it with me. She's like, let's do it. And so we rehearsed extensively uh, that bedroom scene to hit all those beats because I wanted to incorporate her sense of dance into the character, but then pull a fast one. And in the second scene in the film, use somebody who's so adept, adroit at using their body to express and then be absolutely still. And there would be an inherent tension in that, I thought, that somebody who is so used to moving as a performer suddenly is like a statue, is frozen in time and could really only move their eyes. And so I thought that'd be a nice juxtaposition between the two. So for me, rehearsal was so important just for trust, for vulnerability that was happening in that first scene. But for that second scene, I didn't want to rehearse. I wanted that, that's when the actress Tally Bedell, who plays the artist, she and Lily, they hadn't met before that. So that was a very fresh thing. And they both knew the beats in the script, like this look means this. And when you look back, now this is a different exchange of tone. So there was a freshness to that that I think was a nice contrast to all the rehearsal that had taken for the first season. You know? that's, that's interesting. A couple of things that you said about, about, uh, about Parthenon. Um, yeah. Uh, in terms of the rehearsal, I had actually, I was jokingly saying to Dan, or half jokingly, to say, okay, did, did Frank sit there and say, okay, and now pull the, uh, when you stick the finger in the mouth, pull the side uh, uh, a little bit. Okay, then next time, pull it a little more. No, 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 not that much, <laughs> just about that much. Right, you're right. Like how, how dental did things get? Yeah. How, how, <laughs> how dental, yeah, a very dental film. Um, <laughs> for me, in a film specific, specifically where there's no dialogue, it was, or very little dialogue, um, it, it, everything means something. So like every beat, every exchange was supposed to be loaded. So it's like, for me, it's each scene in Parthenon, the two scenes, they're each a duel of sorts. So like there's mm -hmm. a silent duel in the second scene, and the first scene is an actual physical arriving duel, you know, uh, mm -hmm. between these two people. And so we did get very specific, but that was why we had the rehearsal, so that we could know exactly how much we were going to pull them out there, how long the choke was going to be, or what, you know, all these different things that we could time out to give it a great pace. Um, there was one one beat of physical action that was actually, I think, cut out just to make the bedroom scene move even a little faster. Um, okay. Mm -hmm. That we cut out not even in editing, but in uh, rehearsal. I like, had this extra scripted beat of like three or four lines of action, and I was like, it's cluttering it up. You know, it just wasn't working with the actors. So I'm like, let's cut it out. It'll be swifter. Get to the next beat. You know. Everything's better without talking. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're, we're gonna make that the tagline for this podcast. I mean, <laughs> but I think to your point about dialogue, though, it was funny because originally, conceptually, it had no dialogue in Parthenon. Mm. And while we were rehearsing, I realized I was like, it's too much. Like, it, it doesn't feel real enough to have mm -hmm. nothing said. So then the idea was that I give three or four lines to the male. So it's, it's this patriarchal idea these like it's the man who's like stop listen to me like you're not doing what i'm telling you to do and yet she's like i'm communicating in an entirely different way here with my body <laughs> and you don't want to bend to my way of expression like you you want it to stop because you say to stop so i thought it was interesting that like the only voice in the film is the male you know it's not mm. uh, right, right. it's not any of the women right and i kind of noticed between the three films there's like this continued theme of uh, I, I, 
group is probably overstating it, but I, isolation in in what would be considered from a like a, a wider camera angle, I guess, a social situation, right? Like you have the you, you kind of bring out the interiority in spider veins by literally just like we're, we're watching the two women talking and then the entire physical environment changes against everything we know about object permanence in the cinema. Right. And then right. like the in Casa de Mi Madre it's it's two separate uh alejandro has two moms or it's one mom yeah i mean i mean with with casa it's kind of a bel de jour thing right yeah that's a good reference i I mean i guess i was going to ask what you got out of out of casa because out of the three films that's the one that i think seems to be the most i think interpretive in in some in some way Hmm. uh, for some people um i can tell you just what i was thinking but but i'd love to hear what like what you got out of that Oh yeah. So so yeah, I, I really like that you mentioned the diptych thing because that was in the bag. Like you know, when Ron and I finished watching these last night, we had like a short discussion to kind of get ready for this. And and the first thing I kind of noticed was all three films seem to be split in the middle, yeah. pretty pretty like you, you know it's it's a clean slice mm-hmm. or as, as clean as slicing gets. And yeah, I'm, I'm just gonna stop using the word slicing now. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> real slice. <Like, laughs> Real nice, real sliced. Yeah, yeah, it's it's like two pieces of bread that are about like uh, but yeah, everything kind of in. I think spider veins, it's less pronounced, yeah. but the moment transition is kind of when the background shifts from she's in her dressing room to she's at this uh, like party. party for moms or something. Yeah, I, uh, I think for spider veins, you're right. It's a little less of a diptych and more of a. I kind of wanted that to be a little more of a three parter in that you're kind of the stage opening sequence is like you're with the stage manager care, this woman who's dismantling the stage. And then you're suddenly in the eyes of this person who's wandering in this house. You later find out is an actress. Uh, mm-hmm. but then when she's doing the dialogue scene with the other woman, the hostess of the party, that's when the hostess of the party kind of takes over and then it becomes her film. So then we kind of realize that really it's kind of her her conflict, like her assessing her life at that time. More kind of like, I want that to feel more like a passing of a baton, more in spider veins, uh, mm. from like the opening stage to like the stuff with the, the stranger in the house and then into her friend. Like, so it kind of like flows mm. in that way. Well, I think Spider Veins is the only one that has like a very definite sense of like time. Because mm. I think like Casa de Mi Madre, you have sort of like the, the shift in actresses in the middle is definitely interesting. I, I think like the fact that you chose to focus so intensely on, um, right, because she's kind of giving this monologue. We we know she's talking to somebody, but we don't see Alejandro or the kid again right. until like the very end of the film. He's, and so yeah. it, yeah, that kind of isolation and duality mm-hmm. thing. He's called Christian in, that, in the first half, right? Yeah. And, you know, oh. I, for me, duality is the other, I'd say that's the other word across the trilogy, this idea of like the inside and the outside self, right? And like the mm-hmm. interiority versus what's on the external. And um, so I think duality is a great thing to go with the idea of performance, identity. It's kind of thematically linking the three films. But for me, uh, what I was hoping was that you got a sense that this woman who you think is Alejandro's mother is not his mother and she lost her son in this fire but she starts speaking to Alejandra as if he is her son so she says everything to this boy that she wanted to say to her son who died in a fire and then the Mm. little boy Alejandro goes home or excuse me Chris the boy goes home and then his real mother is like where have you been like you where have you been this whole time you're late and all this and when the boy answers to his mother's call it's he's like that's not my name and he is like taking on the name of the dead son from right. the story so the the yeah. idea i wanted to be like the dangerous nature of performance especially with children i mean like in this case like even though she's she's basically bribing a kid with ice cream so that she can use him as a sounding board just to give a monologue mm-hmm. which is kind of horrific and, and awful um and what kind of damage is left on that kid when he gets home you know whereas some people mm-hmm. i guess have also seen as like more of an actual supernatural beat at the end of like is he mm-hmm. has he become you know alejandro you know by the end which i'm fine with mm-hmm. but i was going for <laughs> the idea of performance you know mm-hmm. 
Yeah, yeah. And I, I mean, I think a lot of it probably depends on the flavor of ice cream in terms of long-term psychological damage. <laughs> but... Absolutely. We know there's damage. We're just like, how much damage is up for debate, you know? You know, is, is it Rocky Road? Is yeah. it... You know, interesting story you know, about that, that ice cream, actually, too, though, is when I made that movie, it was in the, it was in a workshop led by uh, Kiristami in Cuba. In, over oh, yeah, we were going to ask you about that. And, yeah. Uh, I mean, we saw the name at the end. Yeah, it was a really special experience. But the film came together in a, such a flurry. And uh, when I was working with the actors in the scene and some of the other uh, people that were nearby that were just kind of watching or helping out, and a lot of them were from Cuba, and they started laughing when originally in the script, in the monologue I had written for the scene, like she calls the boy up to her apartment by bribing him with money. And she's like, you know, I'll give you some money if you come up. And then they all started laughing. They're like, it's a very American thing to do to bribe a kid with money. And it's like, here, they're like, it would be something like a sweet or a toy. But even if we had money, that wouldn't get the kids' attention. Like these other really? Things. And I was like, that's so fascinating. They're like, it's a very American thing to do. And so like, I took their cue, but I was like, we're making this movie right now. We're running out of light. I'm like, we need an ice cream. So we had to like find somebody who had an ice cream, you know, and this wasn't even in uh, Havana. This was in San Antonio uh, de los Banos, which was the, where the, uh, the sc there's a film school that was built there and founded by um, 100 Years of Solitude uh, author, who I'm just blanking. Oh, uh, Garcia Marquez. Marquez. He and uh, Karastami were, uh, were friends. Oh, no kidding. They were going to make a movie together before Marquez passed away. But so Karastami had been going to Cuba and like working with Marquez apparently on an idea. And then when he passed away, the film school was like, well, we want to start holding these workshops for uh, international filmmakers to come in. We pick 50 people. They apply from all around the world and they make a short in 10 days, but then they have lessons and classes with you. And they, so Karastami said, yes. So he led this incredible workshop which is uh with no hyperbole was like seriously one of the best times of my life like getting to be there for 10 days in cuba with one of my favorite filmmakers it was just a, a dream it was a really special mm -hmm. time well it's funny because we we kind of met under it at least the way i perceived it when i was there under similar circumstances i felt like i was kind of at film school with john out in montana for a week uh john jost yeah for for the listeners and Daniel and I, the list, yeah, Daniel and I worked on um, with John Jost and Blake Eckert uh, on, on a movie that we actually we watched for the podcast a couple of weeks ago because we had a uh, we had Blake and John on oh, together. Good. Good. Uh, talk oh, about was that movie? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Frank was in that movie. Oh, which role did you play? I'm sorry. I, no, I'm, no, right. I'm, not only am I bad with spaces, I hadn't actually seen you. So no, no, no. Me. It's fine. Don't worry about it. Uh, they had it coming. Yeah. Oh, they had it coming. Yeah. So I was uh, one of the, I was the brother, uh, the two brothers who kill Blake. And I'm kind of in the bar and uh, have some dialogue with Blake, uh, the okay. storyteller guy. And then, yeah, yeah, yeah. and then later my brother and I kill Blake in the field with the crowbar and the two by four. Right. Um, okay. Okay. Yeah. And then he gets up and he comes on the podcast. Yeah. Right. <laughs> he's doing just fine. He's doing just fine. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. He seems to be doing okay. But then Daniel, you and I played uh, opposite each other in Blake's film. Right. I owed for, for fun. Did that ever, I, you know, I should ask Blake about this actually. When we had my, where did that film go? So is it like done or is it yeah, like. It's, it's done and it's, it's one of his best. It, it turned out really well. It's a really, it reminds me of Carpenter. Did, did our scene make it into the final cut? Absolute. We're, we're in it. But uh, it was originally. I didn't make it to IMDb then. You what? I didn't make it to IMDb that. I thought I got cut from the movie. Well, you should be on there then. No, 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 no <laughs> yeah. Because uh, no, our sequence is still in there. The funny part is originally we were the prologue of the film, mm. in the original script. That in editing, he did some major overhaul of the film and uh, it's, it really turned out amazing. But now we're like a centerpiece. So we're kind of like midway or end of the oh. first third and it works really, really well. But uh, yeah, it's good. So Blake apparently, um, I think he was submitting it out to festivals, but I know that more than that, this company had been interested in getting all of his previous films, mm. uh, the company Synapse. And mm. we were going to release like kind of a box set of Blake's films. And so I think 
I'm not sure when they're. Well, that would be out great because that stuff's like really hard to get a hold of. No, absolutely. But I and he's been he was talking about I don't know when it's coming out, but the deal they made I think was that Coyotes was going to be kind of the special the film that's like this hasn't played anywhere, but it's going to be just in the box set, you know, mm. as like part of the deal of buying the box. You get a whole new movie that you know. <laughs> but uh. But yeah, I so, can get one free. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> so it's really, it's kind of a cool thing. Then they'll have all of Blake's films for this period of time, and he's such a nobody else has a voice like like that guy, you know, mm. as a writer specifically, but a director too. And same with John Jost. I mean, they're both they're both so uh, singular, you know. They're great, great. Films. Yeah, Blake's working on a on a movie about um uh, Bigfoot. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm real, I'm fascinated to see where that goes because it's fiction hybrid last I heard. So I was like, that that gives it a spin that I was really intrigued by. Yeah. yeah. Mm. So it's like, it's fi fiction hybrid as in we can't confirm or deny the existence <laughs> of... A big, I think it was more, <laughs> I think the idea was that he's he's doing some interviews with some some people who really were investigating Bigfoot and even some of their stories. But then also he started writing. I don't want to speak too much for Blake here. I don't know what he told you on the podcast, but I think he also then was kind of inserting a narrative as well, like a scripted narrative to where it feels almost like a docudrama or something like that, you know? Mm -hmm. So well, and, and and if we got any details wrong, it, it was a it was a hybrid documentary fiction. Uh, <laughs> so nothing was wrong. Yeah, it's all, it's all real. Right. It's all real. Yeah, but yeah, I'm excited to see what he does with it. Mm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Cool. So, say so, uh, what what kind of projects or do you have any projects in the pipeline? I uh, I've been writing a 1970s uh, dramatic thriller set over a year in Pittsburgh through the seasons and it's uh it's basically summer of sam meets mm. american graffiti it's kind of like the <laughs> wow it's about muscle cars and the auto industry but it's tied into uh this serial killer that's kind of on the periphery and so it's about all these characters in this kind of altman like you know way of veering off with different storylines how they're all intersect how they're all reacting to it so it's less of a procedural investigative film like zodiac and it's more just about kitchen sink perspective how are your friends neighbors lovers reacting to all this you know how are they uh, grieving with this thing going on so i started writing that i had that idea a long time ago finally started writing the script um it was a massive script and i, I think the problem is that it's such a big script that i need a big budget to do it and even though i've been taking uh thankfully some meetings out here in l.a over the last year and a half about trying to get financing to make it i think the problem is one my previous works are films like Parthenon and mm. nothing like this script, which is very different. And then two, they're not really making big movies like this uh, anymore. Like big movies nowadays are either Oscar bait films or like historical, you know, biopic films or the superhero movies. Like that's where all the money right, right. goes in. Like right. they're not making Boogie Nights anymore. You know, so uh, now I think people are like, they're like, if you want to make a movie that's like a three hour kitchen sink movie, it should be a series. And so I've been. And that's told, why it's been this like mass exodus of uh, kind of like, uh, like, I guess, higher end indie people like flooding the TV industry in the last five, 10 years. Yeah. I mean, I think to, to a large extent, I mean, there's a lot of indie people that have now the gateway for them is not going into making studio films but tv like directing episodic mm -hmm. and you know for me I, I i really this is a new decision too because i i've been for the last three or four years i was always like this movie's gonna be my new my big movie you know mm -hmm. um and now i'm thinking it's a different time like maybe i should redo it and do it as a series in some ways maybe it's more of a win because one it maybe actually has a chance of getting made two um if i do want that novel-esque you know multiple storyline thing that's right for tv you know i can actually take more time with the characters yeah so maybe it's for yeah the i mean altman would have been great i well altman did some tv he did uh what was it tanner 88 yeah i think in one other honor, thing did secret honor for tv yeah, yeah. um via yeah, tv i mean I, I think altman would have fit in pretty well with the current tv environment i think you're right that's, that's a good point eight 45 minute episodes of netflix and then when it ends will there be another one next year <laughs> right right 
You could choose to right. binge watch it or you could watch them separately. Yeah, you're right. I think, and that's the thing I'm struggling with is like how to, like, I, I know I could, you know, make this more, even more full bodied and like, you know, but then the idea is like, do I do this? How, I mean, do I do this for six episodes or eight episodes? Or, you know, that's the thing I'm trying to figure out is, you know, where do you, um, where do you, where do you limit yourself? And then where do you let yourself go, you know, for series format? Wait, so do you, do you already have the script for the, for the, for the, the movie version? Yeah. Yeah, no, but so I have the so the movie version for the last year. So I've been um, I was taking meetings with it out here in LA and talking to different companies and trying to get financing. But I I think you know one of the problems is that I'm I just I've never made a movie like that. All my stuff is more abstract, right. experimental, and so for me to suddenly write a thing that's for me a lot more plot driven and clear and character driven. I think is uh, they're like, well, yeah, like you wrote it, but like, can you direct it? You know, right. can you do this? Mm -hmm. yeah. Which I don't blame. Right. Them, yeah, but it's just a whole new set of obstacles. You know? yeah, it's yeah. funny you mention that because like when when we first met, I was working on that movie out of my car. Yeah, that was that was <laughs> that was two cars ago. But uh, <laughs> I I kind of I'm uh, yeah I, I'm not good for cars, but. <laughs> But yeah, we started out thinking, oh, this is going to be an eight-hour sort of sequel right. to John Jost's like narrative movie, and it ended up being a four-part. Like, I, I became very obsessed with uh, "Perfect Lives" by Robert Ashley. If you've ever seen that, it's like a spoken word opera that was specifically conceived for TV. Oh wow! It it's worth a look. I, I think you'd like it. It's got like a lot of kind of bizarre '80s video monitor editing. Wow. It, it's like if PBS glitched out for three hours. What's the title again? Uh, Perfect Lives by uh, Robert Ashley. It's in seven episodes. Wow. I, people pirate it on YouTube quite a bit, which is which is kind of kind of surprising me because it seems like most people like it's in that weird space where it's like it it's not sure if it wants to quite appeal to the avant garde music people or the avant garde movie people. And so it just ends up falling between the cracks of both. Right. And so I probably watched this thing about 35, 36 times. And, right. and then the, the the road movie, it ended up being this sort of four-part miniseries structure, structured as television, but with none of the none of the, the popular appeals of television. Right. But it's really good at putting people to sleep. <laughs> Hey, that, that's great, you know. That was that was the first time Ron and I met, actually. He fell asleep oh, really? that, that was your first hangout? <laughs> You're like, check out this, we're going to meet you. Check out this film, you know. <laughs> it was a mutual friend of ours, uh, the one that who later introduced us. She didn't actually really introduce us then. Um, she just said, hey, do you want to come see a, a, I can't remember if she called it a film premiere or, or that by a movie that a friend of mine. I don't know if it really had a pre because we didn't end up sending it out to festivals because I looked at it and I was and and Brian looked at it and we were like, this is what we wanted. I don't know if anyone else wants this. So it's sort of like a matter of how many hundred dollar festival submissions. Yeah. You know, am I going to go to the roulette table with totally. this, or am I just going to put it on the internet and hope somebody finds it? It's a fine line, right? It's like, yeah, what do I? What's the best route? I don't know. You know. Well, so so it was at Dan's apartment. Uh, uh, he and his girlfriend have a really nice, big, comfortable couch. Oh man. And I normally fall asleep for at least. Oh yeah. So so Dan is now turning the camera around to show uh, to show uh, Frank. Oh yeah, I got like the Library of Congress in my dining room because I ended up I'm I'm uh, dealing antiques now, so I kind of got. Oh yeah. <laughs> Look, man, I love that. I love all the media. Yeah, I've been like taking apart video game consoles all quarantined. Awesome, man. You got a whole lot. You're like working. You're like a workstation over there. Pretty much, yeah. There's like a pile of, uh, I mean, I guess the listeners aren't going to be able to see this, but I got 10 broken Japanese Super Nintendos in the mail the other day. Hmm. And they're and all over the dead Super Nintendos sitting <laughs> right in the living room right now. Wow. And they're all over the couch, the floor, the coffee table, hanging. Oh, from oh the yeah. Chair. Yeah. yeah. Let's see if I can get a good. Uh, oh, there we go. This, this is to get a good shot for the audience. Yeah, so that's that's what ten oh, broken wow. Japanese Super Nintendos look like. Wow. Oh, they're just in the they're just in the corner in a pile. Yep. Well, yeah, because I haven't gotten the fuses in the mail, so there's not really anything I can do with them. Oh. Oh, oh that's well the mystery. I liked it better before that when I had when I thought that it was all over the apartment. 
Like you had to find all tins, like an egg hunt. No, oh, I mean pre-girlfriend. <laughs> yeah, it was. Uh, it looked like one of those tracking shots in a Tarkovsky movie where there's like like stalker where there's just all the crap and there's bubbly water. You hear water <laughs> dripping somewhere <laughs> off the screen, no matter where you are. Yeah, you, you kind of met me the last time before I was domesticated, but now now it's in a neat pile on the floor. It's got a spot, as my as my father it's used to say. It's got a spot. You know? As long as it's yeah, Elizabeth might not be too keen if it was the way I was imagining it. Yeah. Well, mm. cool. so how how did you end up at the uh, at the Karistami workshop? Or well, I guess you probably just applied, right? Or... I just applied. They they had a uh, they had a almost in an ad, but it's not an ad, but I, they had like a a blurb about it. Like I think it was either an IndieWire filmmaker magazine, and it you know when it says something about ten days Cuba Karistami, I'm like too good to be true. Like there's no way in hell. I'm getting it like it's not possible mm -hmm. you know um and so my friend and filmmaker Cameron Bruce Nelson both applied and mm -hmm. they basically staggered out the people who got accepted like in, in batches like they would kind of announce online and so mm -hmm. it by the end by the first couple times they announced you know 10 so people at a time it was very clear that I had not been selected but Cameron had been and I was so mm -hmm. proud of Cameron like he was the one the batch he was going and then in the last few weeks before the workshop they said hey look we're having some people drop out and so we're now going to our list of runner-ups and I was like in the top 10 runner-up to to come in and so by the skin of my teeth I was able to get in with one of my best friends and and be at this workshop and I actually came from Sundance this is early 2016 and got on a flight and made it to Cuba just in time for the workshop to start yeah. and the whole workshop the whole idea of it was you have 10 days where they put you up they feed you and it's all housed at a film school that's already teaching classes to other students who are there as film students at this school in cuba so it was like this separate organization black factory cinema that was actually based in barcelona and they were the ones that put this together and they said hey look we're being hosted by this cuban school Kiristami's coming in and so for 10 days we put you up we feed you and Kiristami will give you um a prompt on day one, he'll give you he'll give you an idea of what to make your short film about, and then you have to pitch Kiristami. He has to approve it, and then you have to make your film. And on the last day of the ten days is like the big screening day party where everybody screens their films. You have like a big party before everybody leaves. Um, so his prompt was simply family and. So that's where everybody was having to write their scripts and, but everybody, all 50 people had to help each other make their films. So like, even though I did my film, I worked on six other movies. So those days in Cuba are packed and there's no cell phone reception. You know, you're not, you're, this is kind of out in the country, really. It's not like mm -hmm. in the hub of like Havana. So it's very isolated. Um, mm -hmm. So it really taught you how to kind of like think quick on your feet and kind of get back to basics. You know. hmm. How do you manage to work on so many movies at once, participating in other people's movies and making your own? I mean, that was a really tough uh, thing to do. I mean, honestly, I was getting worried that I wasn't going to have my own movie, which would have been a problem, you know, because I was I was right. helping everybody else, I was aiding in one, acting in another. Uh, and but I think part of it was also that I hadn't I didn't have the right idea yet to pitch Karistami. Okay. And so it took a while till I had that idea. And it was like, it was literally, you know, I guess three days from the final day of the event that I was like, I got the idea. I wrote down this feverish monologue of this character. And I knew it was going to be this kind of thing of play with identity. Mm -hmm. uh, I kept thinking of something out of a, a you know, Yorgos Lanthimos film or something where it's like kind of playful. There's like almost like a game at work here, but it's deadly. You know, it's very, it's uh, mm. dangerous. And um, so I pitched it to him and he approved and then had to make the movie. And it was really just like a few people that made it. I think the tricky part was a lot of the other filmmakers that used not actors, just locals. So some were farmers, some were other filmmakers in the group. Um, but I knew that I needed an actual actor to perform this. So luckily for us, the school had one day that they had, I think it was day two or day three, where they had like a meet and greet with actual actors from Havana who came into the school on a bus, had coffee and cake, and you could just meet them. And if you liked them, then you could, you know, contact them to be in your movie. And so even though I didn't have my script yet, there was this one actress there who I met and I was like, she'd be 
cool to work with. Uh, and she ended up being the main actor, actually, and the other actor as well, the one who plays the grandmother at the end, like they were both from that meeting. Right. Like, yeah. cool. mm -hmm. What about the kid? Kid was a non-actor. Kid was just hanging out. He lived nearby. He was a local and he would follow all the filmmakers around. And then he was like, let me help carry equipment and like, let me play with the camera. And so he, and that, his real name's Christian. And so he was just like, I just want to help out it. And I like Christian so much. I was like, you want to be in my movie, you know? And this is all through translation because unfortunately I don't know Spanish. And uh -huh. so there's a lot of learning when it came to making a film, not in your native tongue to where I was like, wow, like everything takes twice as long just in the mm -hmm. sheer direction communication of, of making a film, you know? And so did, did somebody else translate the script you wrote? Yeah, so what I did was I tried my best in my very feeble way using a very, uh, very few bars of internet that we had, like Wi-Fi at the school to translate. So I gave her both the English monologue and my Spanish translation. And she was like, I can't make sense of either one of these. <laughs> then uh, I had, luckily, there was a woman who was incredible, who was working with the Black Factory Cinema team that was hosting this event. But on the side, she was just kind of helping crew, like for some of this filmmakers making these films. So I asked her, do you want to be like my AD essentially and come on? But at first I need you to help me translate this for Carmen. And uh, <laughs> that's what she did. And she, you know, helped make sure that all my, all the lines were translated and made sense. And, and, mm -hmm. uh, and then it was performed. And by the way, that the take that's in the film, that is the absolute, that was the rehearsal <laughs> oh. that the actor did. Like, I didn't hear her say the lines or do anything. Like, she knew the scene. She knew the dialogue. I told her the blocking. And that was it. So that was actually, we only did two takes. So that was the rehearsal. And then she did the actual take. We were rolling on both. But uh, we realized the first one was was raw, you know, was the way to go. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, yeah. This, this is complete. This is very different from what you're describing, you know, earlier, just how what a believer you are in rehearsal. Well, or is it the ultimate belief in rehearsal when you take it over the finished thing? I think my answer, my answer to that is different films call, you know, call for different measures. And I think that, like, uh -huh. in this case, I probably would have rehearsed had we time to do it. But, you know, you, you have a hard time getting a hold of somebody in Cuba. There was a lot of, like, leaving notes, hoping that they would find it. And then, you know, like, the bus broke down. And so there was just all these kind of things that um, made it like a 48-hour film race more than anything, but led by Abbas Kiarostami, you know. Right, right. I was going to say, when, when you were saying the the kind of primer, like, Kiarostami gives a prompt and everybody has to pitch it and then make the movie in a week. I, I was like, this would this would be a great reality television program. It would be like, uh, they had that show, what was it, uh, On the Lot. Oh, but, yeah, 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 like, yeah. Yeah, On the Lot, like, they put you in, it's like, you have to care what Gary Marshall says about your movie and, like, oh, even yeah, America. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot all about that. Yeah. No, you're right. I mean, that's that's honestly what it was was a 48 hour film race. But but I think I, I think the cool part about it was you're getting these lessons and lectures from Kiarostami every day in the morning. So everybody has breakfast together and coffee, and then he either shows one of his films or talks about it or talks gives a lesson, and then you go off and shoot the rest of the day. You know. Mm -hmm. And so it was it was against kind of my. Uh, what I usually feel comfortable in. And yet at the same time, it was so much, it was just like hoping for the best and being like, prepare, 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 and then know that you may have to throw everything out the window. Yeah. And that's, I think that's just kind of a good way to be in general. Because as an actor, I've, I've, you know, you do all these things, you think about your character, you have all your lines down and then you get set and they're like, hey, guess what? Like, we're now not shooting in a building, we're shooting in a barn and it's now winter, it's not summer. And, you know, you're now smoking in the scene, you're a chain smoker, did I not tell you that? Okay, you're a chain smoker, so you're smoking. And so like, you know, all of a sudden you're throwing all these things sometimes, you know, I just gotta go with it. but. Hopefully everything that you put into preparation and preparing for the role or the film can come out in some ways and help you get to this new place. You know? So um, when, when I saw uh, Karastami, I, I, I can never pronounce his name right. No, so yeah, yeah. I was excited because, uh, what was that? Oh, and I say, no, it's okay, yeah. It's okay, okay, all right. Yeah. A Taste of Cherry is one of my favorite movies. I don't have a top 10. It's We counted at something like top 23. Oh, yeah. But it, it's pretty high up. It is in an Excel spreadsheet, though. Like, yeah. We're not sure the exact number, but it's very cleanly laid out. Yeah, yeah, I have it as, uh, I, I do have them laid out. You, um, you and me but, both, though, Ron. 
that's my favorite taste of cherry that was the first taste i saw and it like blew my mind wide open yeah isn't that amazing yeah, yeah. um but he uh, uh so so dan was talking about my falling asleep at at his movie screening yeah um so i i usually fall asleep during movies for about i don't know five ten fifteen minutes and i he, he I, missed I, the middle one like no no no, no. he didn't fall <laughs> Um, um, but, but I feel, I would say, uh, you know, justified, exonerated. I feel like uh, maybe, the, I don't know if that's the right word, exonerated, because there was something that, that Karastami said yeah. about, um, a comf making, you know, a movie that, that you feel so comfortable and safe in. I don't remember exact words that, you know, you fall asleep during it. You're absolutely, so he, he, he as, said that you know, in Cuba. You're right. He said that same thing. He's like, you know, it's okay to fall asleep, like during a film and he goes ideas can affect your you know your dreams like you're so you're almost becoming like a co-op or creating your own thing from watching the movie oh yeah i'm totally dreaming like parts of the movie whether it's a continuation or whether i'm hearing bits of it and right while i'm sleeping yeah oh yes yeah, so some of my favorite memories are, are of watching movies or falling asleep because like when i was in college i had i went to cuny and I could get into the MoMA movie theater for free with my student ID. Yeah. And I was in New York City over the summer in college one year, and I was living in the, the fifth floor of this, like, brownstone, like, fucking, you know, half pizza oven, half a apartment complex with no air conditioner. And so I would just go over to the, you know, I, I go on the subway, go to the MoMA, watch three movies a day because they had air conditioning. And I would fall asleep because it would just be like the time when I was cool and comfortable yeah. enough to sleep. I, I love, I love your, your, your story though, like being so hot, like in the summer, like the cool movie theater. Because I, I have that feeling, memories as a kid, just of like always being hot in the summer in Texas. And then, you know, going to the movie theater in the middle of the day it was like this escape you know yeah it always felt kind of like what a church was supposed to be absolutely absolutely <laughs> i mean and then you know who is it what was the filmmaker that always said that actually was it scorsese i think or somebody who said that basically that the theater is like his church it's like that's like the place the sanctuary to to rest you know right and and you have like it's one of the few modern spaces where you have a lot of people they're paying attention to the same thing with a right. certain seriousness right they're congregated, but they don't necessarily know each other, but they kind of come together as this yeah. collective body for the purpose of, uh, you know, sometimes gawking, but but usually something something a little more prestigious. No, you're right. This is the wrong word, but yeah. No, totally. Yeah, that's those are good memories. That feeling, I can I can have that feeling just you telling that story, like immediately I think of being a kid again, and just like sweating, just like cooling off in this chair with a Coke. Oh yeah, you were in Texas. Yeah, yeah New York's really nothing compared no, to that. I, I mean, I know, but you, you all have the, the asphalt, like the buildings and the concrete glass so this like becomes a oven of like you know <laughs> what do you do yeah well go to the movies yeah yeah i miss them not going to be able to to do that this summer i mean i guess they are at least in massachusetts they're going to start opening movie theaters soon i oh, think wow. but they're very you know they're 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 being very slow and very methodical about about things and they're ready to like pull back as soon as if there's any any resurgence or any, any increase um you know very careful social distancing but i i'm still not going to go and i miss that because i'm going to get really hot and i'm going to want to spend absolutely I set up the projector in the backyard if you want to come over and like sit at a distance. <laughs> that sounds great. That sounds good with friends. It's like low key, you know. Oh, Dan, do you have the um the the screen, the portable screen that I gave you? I do, but I found a blanket that's larger. Oh, okay, okay. That's, that's a, like fairly that's a good bit larger. So the the screen I've been using for other stuff. Okay. <laughs> I, I had actually sort of paperweight. actual like original original conception of the movie I was shooting when I met you was uh it was gonna be a four screen installation. The four things that ended up becoming the episodes were just gonna play at the same time. Some somehow we were gonna like hack into the back of a Target or a Walmart, put it on those TVs in the back next to like the the lawn, the deck chairs. Yeah, yeah. And just run it until they fix the TV or somebody got arrested or something. <laughs> And, you know, that wasn't the most doable plan, but maybe if I had a better agent. I would have had to do, uh, if I'd gone there, I would have had to take four simultaneous naps. Yeah, that's <laughs> a lot of naps. That's like, yeah. that's like losing a whole day. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, you, you were going to, like, Goldilocks the entire bed and bath department at the Target. <laughs> <laughs>
I did once, I took some friends, uh, uh, I went to buy uh, couches and I took some friends and they thought that it was, you know, just going to go take a little bit of a look and, 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 and pick something. I was like, no, 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 no. I jumped onto every couch. I laid down on it, make sure, you know, that there's enough room yeah. like that I could sleep, but also that the, the sides are just the right height so I could rest my head on them a right. little up so I could right. watch TV. Um, and yeah, I probably tried about 15 couches like that. Hey, you gotta be sure. You gotta be sure. Yeah, yeah. It's gotta have the right comfort level at yeah. all angles. It's important. It's <laughs> <laughs> I, that one, that's like your, that's the most important part of furniture in your apartment, I think, Ron, right? Uh, like the ability to lie down. The most. The way? Yeah, your couch. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, Frank, I live in a, in a, I live in a studio. Oh, nice. Um, so, so my living room and bedroom are the same thing. It yeah. just depends on the angle. And my bed, it, I've got a couch. I can actually pull it out into a bed, but I choose not to. Yeah. I actually like sleeping on couches. I got rid of the actual bed. Oh, that's awesome. That's great. I like that you have the option though too. Like if you really wanted, you could pull it out and like have the bed. Like it's like a mm. pulled out. But it's cool that you. Yeah, once once in a long does while. It, does it make you feel like you're living more intentionally? If I uh, if you don't fold out the the couch into a bed. Yeah, yeah. Because I was saying I could do it, and I choose not yeah, to. Yeah, exactly. Because there's just a bed there that I. Yeah, yeah the options there, but yeah. Right. Like, right. like Niet Nietzschean element of affirmation. <laughs> yeah. My my only my only knowledge of I only know two things about Nietzsche. Uh, yeah, see, I'm going to pronounce that Nietzsche. Um, um, uh, God is dead, for we have killed him. Is that the full? Um, and and the other is that I stole uh, uh, the title for my first semester of college uh, uh, English paper uh, was I, it was called it was like the death of tragedy or something like that. I stole something from Nietzsche. Oh yeah, yeah. His earliest uh, essay is called "The Birth of Tragedy," and he kind of talks about the idea of catharsis in the theater, and then it, it, he sort sort of starts laying. I took a Nietzsche course when I was in college, mm. but, but he starts laying out some of the stuff for the the late. The fun stuff is all the later stuff when when it's got like a little bit of syphilis to keep things sexy. Yeah, keep it exciting. <laughs> <laughs> you need the syphilis to keep it exciting. Right, it, it's like half, uh, what is it, like half Schopenhauer and then half like uh, Ch Charlie Sheen with the tiger blood stuff. Like, oh, the greatest author who ever lived. That's the other, you know. Of, care of uh, somebody's character. You know. <laughs> <laughs> that tiger's blood. <laughs> That's the new, like. <laughs> That's good. From now on, I'll be like, you know, I got to think about this. What would Daniel say? I need more tiger's blood. I'm going to make this game. <laughs> <laughs> oh man so okay this is very specific to to the movies um yeah. uh, to, to your movies rather um we're wondering uh, in spider veins there's the scene at the party um in which the camera is is, is turning around yeah and it's it, it, so you see the faces of the women around the table talking yeah how did you get that how did you do that yeah so we, we had theories. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Ryan thought it was a lazy Susan. Um, I thought you were like pushing somebody on roller skates. We we did. We had a lot of ideas on how to on how to do that, and we ultimately uh, just put the camera on a tripod in mm -hmm. the middle. And so like the circle is a lot bigger than it would be in real life, just because the lens we had on the camera. So the circle was actually very. They were actually wider, further apart from each other than it looks on camera, so that we mm -hmm. could put the cameraman and the AC in the middle on a camera on a tripod. And all he did was just, he just operated it and moved it around three and a half, four times. And all those lines, all the, the subjects that the women are talking about with a few key lines were all scripted, but, but like the, the subject matter was all planned. So we rehearsed that a few times. And then once we got the pace down of this kind of improv dialogue, um, then we started rehearsing it with camera to time out because the trick was to at a certain point of subject matter to get to the empty chair at the end mm -hmm. and not get there too quickly. Um, and so then we just did it several. I think we did that like thirteen takes or something like that. It was something. Yeah, because I was gonna say that's like incredibly. It it was so smooth looking. Yeah. Thanks. I appreciate it. I mean, that, my DP, uh, my friend Lee Luna, he's a great friend of mine. And he and I actually went to high school together. He lives in Seattle, but he uh, he shot that film. And he and I had come from making two or three installation projects together that we kind of co-directed. And so we kind of took some of the style of those uh 
installation projects and kind of put that into spider mains in a lot of ways. Yeah, because I, I used to have a lot of respect because like anytime I'm holding the camera on my own, it just looks like, uh, I, I, I don't know, like like the birth of Adam doing a doctor's signature. It's just, just like, <laughs> no, I you know, it's just bad. No, I understand. I mean, and you know, he, and that's the other thing. Everybody's got different strengths, right? In terms of camera, because, uh, you know, Lee, he's very good with like these perfectly composed frames, you know? And, and so he and I would always be like, you know, how can we do uh, no handheld and everything we do is either still frame or it's a, it's a moving camera, but it never feels reckless. Whereas like, I specifically wanted my friend Cody Stokes uh, to shoot Parthenon because Parthenon, I wanted it to have this kind of handheld quality for that first scene, you know? Mm -hmm. So it was a, a very different situation for that. Yeah, and I, I really liked the the first half. The first half of Parthenon, I, I think bef before I kind of figured out what was, or to the extent I figured out what was going on. I mean, there's definitely, like, I didn't realize in Casa de Mi Madre until you mentioned it a little while ago that it was supposed to be the mother and the grandmother. I thought it was just same lady switched switched up in the middle but i got you yeah just just kind of like how it well i guess through all three films there's this incredible attention to color color palettes how colors interact everything seems like very intentional in in terms of you know the, the um spider veins there's all those kind of like almost mondrian style flat yeah and yet i, I thought like uh, the first half of parthenon i, I just really liked the fact that the images were compelling still without context, like, like I think in the Middle Ages they called it hasiety, but it like translates to like the thisness of something. Oh, interesting. And, and I thought that was like, I mean, it is kind of like superstition, but but I almost feel like you can tell when the the filmmaker whether or not the filmmaker is engaged with the act of filming once they get to it, or if right. they're bored with it. Yeah. Yeah. scripting sometimes you get the sense of uh kind of like they're sick of this shit by that point that's a good point <laughs> that actually it means a lot because in some ways i i think parthenon was probably the film i mean that and casa de mi madre and i think it shows not only in the style but in the, maybe the feeling you're talking about that maybe comes through and those two films in particular i think there was an energy at play that was me like going back to my idea of me being right by the camera but there's a sense of immediacy and energy. And I think also the fact that between the three films, Parthenon specifically has, is, for my taste, it's almost like an action film. You know, like there's so much, it moves so much more quickly compared to the other two. Uh, yeah. You know, which is probably normal pace, I guess, for most people's taste, but. Yeah, yeah and Spider Veins is a lot of space between lines. Yeah, and it's a, it's a stiller film. Like it's like, it's, um, you know, wax museum that's barely breathing like spider veins i feel like it's like it's just very still whereas hopefully the other two films feel a little more uh unpredictable you know so this is i'm sorry i can't say this without laughing no 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 now you gotta say it though you know now you, <laughs> now you gotta yeah <laughs> not getting out of it now ron yeah you have to talk it out you know this do way. it do oh. it <laughs> So this is a very important question, yeah. and I don't think we could possibly, this would not be complete without this, but your IMDb page has a very detailed bio, but the overview at the top just consists of saying height five foot seven. So are you actually five foot seven? And how do you feel about that reflecting <laughs> being your overview? <laughs> being like my overview? Um, I don't you know, I guess it's just a detail. It's just like one more detail about, uh, you know, a part of your life, you know, where you're from, height, all that stuff, all, you know, all this external stuff. Nobody's made a great film about height yet. It's up to you, Dan. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wait, how tall are you, Dan? I'm, I'm also five foot seven. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm 5'11", roughly. Uh, really? Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm, I'm you know, I, I'm not like super tall, but I'm, Tall, tall enough. You know, I wanted to be like the the great kind of poet of food or, or like write songs about food, but then Weird Al beat me to it. So maybe this is the uh, the new thing. You can make... Uh, Always time. So if you make songs about food, you make uh, movies about height? Yeah. <laughs> or or an eight-part 
<laughs> eight 45 minutes episodes on Netflix that you binge watch. Well, I, I guess there's like all those, there's like Life's Too Short that uh, that show that was on HBO for a little bit about the, like there's a lot of things about the extremes of height, but I feel mm -hmm. like the, the subtler, the kind of gray middle area of height has not been explored in the cinema. There you go. There's something's got to be done about that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I was. I had tried to find the most absurd question that I could possibly ask you. No, it was totally out of left. It was good, man. It was totally out of left field. It got me. I didn't know what you were gonna say. I said, like, "Who knows?" What it's just talking. great that that's the overview. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's the first thing they mentioned on a breakdown. Yeah. You know. <laughs> so what are you working on now? Are you are you working on anything while under? Uh, or well, well, you got that script you're working on. I got, I got that script, which I'm you know figuring out you know what I'm gonna do with it and where it's gonna go. But aside from that, I mean, you know, with the pandemic, there's just, there's kind of a, everything's on hold, you know, everything's kind of uh, on lockdown. So I've just been trying to do as much writing as I can, I'm trying to do voiceover work here and there for a little money, and mainly just trying to work from home just to kind of keep, keep moving around. But uh, it's hard to say, because I think everybody's so eager to get back to work. You got some of these filmmakers that are, you know, in the trades, they're talking about, they're trying to go through the right COVID process and you know have a safe set and how to make that happen um yeah. but it's the wild west right now I mean, everybody's trying to figure out like what is the right way to go about that should that even be happening in the first place i mean a lot of right. people are saying it's going to be a year or two lost really to be realistic mm -hmm. of, of stuff to really be done um, i was expecting it to be like this wave of uh like i way way came out with that movie a couple years ago where he was in, um what is it where he shot it entirely under house arrest oh i was thinking of jafar panahi for a second when you were oh oh maybe, maybe somebody yeah. else did it but maybe you mean me. i thought it was i way way maybe it wasn't i way way yeah but yeah i was expecting like 200 variations on that movie to start bubbling to the surface but so far it seems like the the new the new movie genre is like tv reunions via zoom call <laughs> yeah. i i think like there's seems, hundreds of those so far it seems like that seems to be the way i what was the uh i was talking to a friend the other day and he has this idea for this great film. He's like, I'm, I want to make it right now because I just don't think it's possible to make it though. And I was thinking of what was that? It was either Chantal Ackerman film or maybe it was. I mean, now's the perfect time to make a Chantal Ackerman. Or maybe it was under this French, this other French filmmaker I can't think of. When basically she got Gerard Depardieu and they sat down in the living room, set up a camera, and they did a script reading of this big movie about a trucker that they were gonna make but they couldn't. So the whole movie ends up becoming about them talking about the movie they were going to make, and then they're going to do a fight oh. about it. Like, that's the whole movie. And I was like, that's great. That's fantastic. Like, what a way to, like, write us through the yeah, adventure. For an episode. Figure this out. That, that's, uh, oh, definitely. If we find the name of that movie, yeah, that, that's going on the list. And I can't think of the filmmaker's name, what her name is. Oh, I would. I'm just writing it down. I mean, that's, I feel like every, right now, everybody's trying to find some way to make work in quarantine, which I think is really admirable and just shows, you know, you're making movies no matter what. But then some movies you just want to make, it's like not possible. Like, I can't make my 70s Pittsburgh movie, you know, right now. Mm. So. Right. Yeah. yeah. So I've just been trying to just keep afloat by by writing and uh, plotting ahead, just to be ready that like if something happens, you know, that I'm ready to go. You know, we'll see. Cool. Yeah. What about? You? Uh, well, I've been uh, I've been doing a lot of writing because I I wanted to write a book about the history of televisions. Yeah. For a long time, and so I. And you mean the actual television, the the set, not like necessarily like history of television as like a social phenomena but like a lot of the research has involved taking apart broken electronics oh, nice. And, nice. Uh, that's actually put me in a good place uh because you know everybody's home right now everybody wants like old video game crap again and i was just kind of hoarding it as research materials so I'm, i can finally start bailing the basement out a little bit yeah, that's great that's great that's great <laughs> make a couple bucks here and there yeah. you know maybe even a video game every couple of days. You said I. I've been. I did a lot of research into the history of video games because that seemed to be the last piece that I hadn't really ever engaged with that directly. But it seemed like you know you can't really talk about televisions as a social phenomenon without at least a pretty decent grasp on the history of video games and things like that. Mm -hmm. 
um and now i'm now i'm writing it I'm writing some uh yeah and then uh what else have i been working on learn how to cook chili that's oh, been that's cool. <laughs> great and like barbecue a lot of barbecue and slow cooker stuff uh and the you know this the podcast podcast has been a lot of fun this is uh, episode 49 wow i was just right on the edge 50 of the 50th uh, <laughs> yeah. right on the edge it's it's the second episode of season two oh nice. and uh, awesome and you're the first interview of season one hey absolutely yeah, you're two. like our season premiere oh yeah. man you guys yeah so you guys. no pressure yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> yeah hope, this, hope this turned out okay <laughs> this is when the network decides whether or not to pull the plug That's right they're like you know <laughs> what if you're going with that mosley guy this is what we wanted sorry <laughs> but yeah i appreciate you having me this is really it's really great yeah hey thanks for thanks for coming on and uh you know whenever you know if you want to come back on some point uh doors open you know we Thank you. Yeah, I think it would be cool if we had like a roster because I I feel feel like the guests we've had so far I I don't know I, I like all of them so if we had like a yeah yeah guest of people coming back on every once in a while once they finish stuff that would that's be cool. that's a really good idea yeah you know, a little recap bring them back on especially with the like the son of Sam thing because that that sounds really interesting Thanks. like it it's a little bit um yeah I really want to see the movie yeah <laughs> can you make it please it means a lot it's it's really uh. I'll say this much. Shut up and take my money. You yeah. <laughs> Shut up and take my money. Yeah. <laughs> I wish that I, man, I, yeah, I wish I could make it now, but I'll say that it's like my love of horror movies. Mm. Out. Like I loved horror movies as a kid. So I feel like it's my, me getting to do my version of that, which is still really more of a drama than a horror film, but, but uh, it's hopefully still tense. I'm excited about it, you know? Oh yeah. Well, Wait, I hate horror movies. Maybe I don't want to see this. So. Well, that's, I think that's the thing, right? It's like, it's, it's, it should feel so uh, hopefully tense, even when it's like you're not seeing something horrific happening, but you're hoping you should still feel like a tension in the air, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, that's what I'm excited about. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. I'm glad you, I'm glad you guys are into it. Yeah, yeah. We, uh, yeah, maybe when uh, when Blake's box set or whatever comes out, we'll we'll have we'll have like a little round table. Oh, that'd be cool. Yeah, have like a few people from the the films. Yeah, yeah. See, we can get like Ryan and uh, yeah. uh, Roxanne. And, uh, well, we're hopefully we're gonna have Roxanne on soon. I've been having a little bit because of the time zone difference. Right. It's been a little bit of trouble scheduling, but uh, we're we're looking forward to it. She's so she's so incredible. I I. I haven't talked to her in a while. We used to email, but it's been a while. So mm -hmm. she's lovely. She's, she's oh yeah, she's great. Yeah, she's an well, actress, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. She was the person we were uh, we were messaging with about the uh, the play she was in. Oh yeah. right, right, right. About the the kind of Zoom reading of the play. She played my mother, and uh, they had it coming. Mm. Yeah, this is actually oh. just a podcast about they had it coming. We're we're just gonna like slowly track down every <laughs> individual piece of that movie. Although I actually, now that I'm saying that, like I kind of want to have Marshall on because that would be. Well, you gotta have I. I mean, you talk about a, a season finale for your podcast. You need Marshall Gaddis. <laughs> you guys will be set. You'll do another episode. We're one. saving Marshall for Sweeps Week. That's right. <laughs> season finale with the King of Butte, Montana. <laughs> I won't be happy until we have the gaffer on. There you go. Well, that's gonna be John Jost, right? John Jost does that. Yeah, I think John did all that. that. Yeah. But he'll, you know, you could do an interview each time, but as a different person on the same film. But it's John every time. You know, he'd love. To <laughs> <laughs> he'd love to and he gets the same answers to every question. But slightly, uh, slightly different. You know, I miss that guy too. I miss John. He's man. I don't know if it's it's a good thing actually to end on. But uh, the uh, have you seen any of his latest stuff at all? Have the two of you seen any of his new films he's been making? Uh, like how new are we talking? He did. He Dan did has to say yes. Some <laughs> short films, and he did a new film called Tourists that I think is one of his best films I've ever seen that he's made, and it's his his last one. And then he's done a couple of shorts that were really good. Like he had, he did one that apparently was supposed to be he posted about it online. It was supposed to be part of an anthology film for films made during the pandemic, and apparently whoever was putting the film together they didn't want john's film it wasn't what they were after it's too abstract or something and i watched and i'm thinking this is this is great it's like one of john's best I feel like john and like any kind of like it, it's like that groucho marx joke like 
Like, you know, the, 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 he's not going to be any part of any club that would have him as a member, but there's also like this element of like Charlie Brown kicking the football. That's right. <laughs> That's, right. <laughs> That's a good line. Yeah, they, I don't know what it is, but I, when I saw the short, I thought what was so funny is I think it's his most accessible film. <laughs> <laughs> yet the director or whoever was putting this together supposedly said, no, this is too out there. Like, we can't do this. Mm. Or like, you should check him out if you can. He's still. Yeah, definitely. Well, we'll have to have him back on. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Because I, I asked him, like, what do you want to talk about? And he's like, I want Blake to come on. And I was like, what, what movie do you want? And he's like, obviously, they had it coming. Yeah. And maybe we'll have to we'll have to do them separately next time. Mm. <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about like the individual work. Yeah. yeah. No, that'd be great. No, no shortage of podcast topics. No, we got it between all of us. And uh, if you get rocks on there, tell her I said hi. Oh, definitely, definitely. I need to touch base with her. She's still in Turkey, or is she? Uh, so her uh, her husband just died. So I saw that, and but I couldn't tell where she was whether she was uh, she told me she's kind of like figuring out um i mean i, I imagine like it's it's a transitional kind of period to begin with but then a an international pandemic kind of raises the stakes on the the transitionalness yeah yeah it's a lot yeah and it's a semi-permanent transition yeah it's true. Transformation. Anyway, thanks for coming on, Frank. Yeah, uh, thank you, Dan. Thanks come for back anytime. Thanks for having me. Oh, oh and, and this has been a nominee, Questionable Movies, with Dan, Ron, and uh, Frank Frank Mosley. Check Frank out at... Frank uh, where, where should you check Frank? At, yeah. at where? FrankMosley.com. You can see some of my work and check it out. Okay, and, and, and spell your last name out for everyone, because I know I kept misspelling it. Sure, it's M-O-S-L-E-Y. Okay. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. There's only one E. I kept inserting an extra E at different some places. Some movies have two E's. Some have the E in a different spot. It's, it's different for everybody. Yeah, send this guy some work. Hey. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> for sure. No, it's always great talking. Thanks so much again. Yeah, this was fun. All right. Take care, everyone.